Did he take his own life or did the CIA take him out? Is he still alive? The life and times of John McAfee is one of the most interesting, bizarre, and strange stories you have ever heard. What does it have to do with our current situation? What information did McAfee have? Was there a dead man switch related to his information? All that and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Jeremy Ryan Slate program. I'm your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO and co-founder of Command Your Brand. We are a PR agency that helps to place our clients on top podcasts to really combat cancel culture and make a bigger impact out there. And if you want some help to get out there and make a big impact, grab our new best-selling book over at bestpodcastbook.com. Reminder, if you are brand new to this channel, like this video, leave us a comment and smash that subscribe button if you support Liberty freedom and want to build a better future. Quick preamble to this episode is um, this interview was done about a year and a half ago before we have our current camera set up. So the color isn't as perfect as I'd like, but it is a very intriguing conversation. And uh, I think you are very much going to enjoy it. So enjoy. Our guest today is Mark Eglinton, and we're going to take a look at the life and times of John McAfee. I just finished his incredible book, The McAfee Tapes, all about John's life. And I, I've got to say, I'm still pretty confused about John McAfee after reading the whole thing. So, Mark, I'm, I'm excited to dive in with you today. So thanks for hanging out with me today, man. Yeah, very pleased to be here. And just, just to preface all of this, I'll say that I'm still pretty confused by John <laughs> McAfee as well. Having spent a few months with him, uh, I'm in the same place. I, I got done with it and I'm kind of like, I, you know, to me, the thing I had the most trouble, and we, we'll, we'll, we'll get into how you and McAfee connected with him in a minute, but like the thing I had the most trouble with is it seemed like he was in 50,000 locations, like from here to there to here to there. It was like actually kind of hard to keep up with Mer where McAfee was, where he was going and what things were going wrong in that current location. Like to me, that was the toughest thing to keep up with. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a guy who, you know, as you say, was in a number of different places throughout his life. And these and the, the, the ones that we talk about in the book aren't even all of them. Yeah. Uh, we don't even get around all the locations. These were just the kind of bullet points of this life, uh, given the, the the way that our relationship worked out. But yeah, he's incredibly hard to pin down. And as you also say, things pretty much always went wrong in the places that he was in. That was just one of the, the, the facets of John's life. Because of the way he lived, because of this maverick approach he took to everything, eventually things fell apart. And, you know, consequently because of that, he'd go somewhere else. Well, so for people that aren't familiar with with John McAfee, um, he, he is an entrepreneur in you know really one of the the pioneers in the space of, of virus protection software. And I don't I don't know you didn't talk about this in the book, but I always had a feeling like he was creating these viruses so that he could cure them. Um, but <laughs> interestingly enough, he was one of the early people in that space. He was big in the in the crypto area as well, which actually for you was was one of the reasons that the book didn't actually become the book it was intended to be. So for people listening, you know, how did you connect with McAfee and, and how did this book project come to be? Yeah, just to, just to rewind a little bit to what I do. I mean, I write with people. Uh, I'm, I'm traditionally a ghostwriter or a co-writer whereby I, I tell people stories for, for them. And John was one of the people I'd always admired and thought, I just can't believe there isn't a, a book out there by this guy. Uh, you know, great story. So much of what I knew about his time in Belize was worthy of a book in its own. In fact, there is a documentary out there. People will know it. It's on, on I think it's a Showtime documentary on his life in Belize. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting. So I reached out to him on Twitter, sent him a message and said, how about an autobiography? And he came back to me and said, how much will it cost me? And I said, it won't cost you anything. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about how it works. Uh, we'll get into all that, but before we do anything, I need to see your face on Skype or on FaceTime or something. I need to know this is you and that you're committed to this. So, and I tell this story in the book, and it's one of the, the, the fun things uh, about all of this. I was driving uh, on the freeway with my wife between Edinburgh and my hometown, and all of a sudden my cell phone lit up with John McAfee on the screen. And, uh, you know, we hadn't arranged to talk at that time. We'd arranged to talk much later that night. And my wife and I both looked at this phone screen and said, 
you got to answer that. So I pulled off the freeway into a gas station, which I now call McAfee Plaza, and sat there in the pouring rain on some Tuesday in October and talked to John McAfee. And from that point onwards, we never had any moments of doubt that he and I were going to be a working partnership. That was it. He needed to see me. He needed to get a sense of what I was all about. And once he had that, we were, we were rolling. I, I found it interesting as well that like kind of initially you talked about how McAfee would just call whenever he felt like calling. So you had yeah. some of the, the oddest uh, like appointment times, which to, to me as a writer, that's got to be a little hard to even like keep track of all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, on a psychological level, I was pretty certain he was testing me. It was this whole, you know, where is the sort of balance of power in this relationship? Is this a guy who's going to jump when I want him to? Is this a guy who's going to put his phone on, his notifications on silent for the weekend and re-engage on Monday morning? I just, I just think he wanted to know what I was, and I knew that he wanted to know what I was. So I didn't really play that game. I did answer that call because I had to. But thereafter... I actually dictated the scheduling. I said, John, you will be on a call at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and we'll talk for two hours or one hour and then we'll talk the next day. And by and large, he was good with that, apart from when he went AWOL, <laughs> which, which happened quite a few times during the process. And, you know, I explained that in the book. There were several times where I thought, this is, this is over. I'm never going to speak to him again. You know, the thing that I, that I found interesting, um, and, and I think this was something you mentioned in the book, it, it seems like there's almost two, if not more, John McAfee's, that at times he was very thoughtful, at others he was very quick to snap to a decision. I guess when, when you looked at that, like knowing John, how did you reconcile those, those two parts of him? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's probably 10 different <laughs> John McAfee's. But I think you, those are the those most are the two main, pronounced. Those are the two, the, the two main ones, but... I looked at it this way. On one hand, I know that John wanted to do this book that we had in mind because 74 years old, he tried to do books in the past that failed. He had somebody he could trust. And I, I just think this was his time. But at the same time, he was in hiding. He was obviously under a ton of pressure and of, of different kinds. I'm never really entirely sure. And that's, again, part of the story. What pressure really was he under? Were the CIA trying to get him? Were there other bad tra guys trying to get him? We don't know that. But what I do know is that in some days his mood was bad. Mm. And I put it down to that. Just simple stress. Uh, that, you know, yes, I want to write this book. But at the same time, there's other stuff going on in my life that I don't need to tell this guy about. So I just kind of rolled with it. I, I'm used to people being kind of different in their moods with, with clients. It's not a new thing. And with John, you know, such a, such a great project, I was willing to go with pretty much anything. And he was quite rude at times. Uh, I was okay with it. Well, one of the, one of the things I, I found interesting about like there there seemed to be a cycle of of how he operated in his life and and you you can let me know if if I'm going in the right direction on this but it, he would he would start a new position like eventually it, 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 the thing that was crazy is people would pay him way too much money which which it seemed like mm. to do these things so I almost wondered if he was lying they would pay him way too much money he would do a project in like a day and then figure out how to stretch it into like a year or more of like you know getting paid for it and that almost seemed to do him a disservice because it kind of was like the, the the idle mind is the devil's workshop type of thing. Is is that what you seem to discover in talking to him? Yeah, I mean the the money the money side of it, I was suspicious of as well. I thought, God, that sounds like a lot of money for a six month contract. But what you have to remember at that time is that there were so few programmers mm -hmm. in in that era. There was there was there was hardly anyone that could do what he did, and he genuinely was a genius. So I don't doubt that these companies were throwing money at him. Uh, I think that part is okay. But you're right, what he would do is he would solve a problem that this, these companies thought was extremely complex and would probably take six months to do. He'd solve it in two days and would kind of make himself so indispensable to them that he, they had no choice but to go along with his sort of various ways. And one of them was, you know, I just won't work in an office. That was the sort of starting position. I'm not coming into an office. I have to work from home. I mean, there's a lot of companies that would say, sorry, that's just not You're happening. not going to work here. <laughs> yeah, they just went along with it. 
And of course, this was all by design for him because him working in the office meant he was doing whatever the whatever the hell he wanted to do elsewhere. And that's what he did, but none of this would have worked. And this is the key to all of this. None of this would have worked if it wasn't for the fact that he could do the job. Because if he couldn't do the job, someone would knock on his door or wherever he lived and say, hey, listen, you haven't done, you haven't done this project, you're finished. But the work was always delivered, and it kind of put these bosses, whether it was Siemens, whether it was you know the telecom company in Rio, put them in this really awkward position. They had this renegade employee, did the job. What he was doing the rest of the time, we have no idea. It, it, it was a really tricky thing, but eventually, as you say, you know, idle hands, he got into trouble, and something went wrong, he had to leave. But the method was okay, it actually was. It was interesting because it, it just seemed like, and and because you guys had this conversation early in the book where you discussed kind of the, um, you know, one of the first times that he, you know, was with a woman and, and some of the, 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 mm. the, it seemed like he was just really, I guess, messed up in the dating and, and, and sex and marriage world. Like I could, can't even keep track of the number of times the man was married. I almost lost, lost track through the, through the book. It seems yeah. like that was something that continually like messed him up because it was almost that he couldn't have a stable relationship. Like, I don't know if you saw that yeah we tackled that in depth because you know uh i, I posed a question to him on a couple of a couple of occasions you know, like, why did you get married again you know you knew that this was going to happen that the history was there with with such and such a relationship yet you walked straight into something similar and he explained it and i guess you know people look at this kind of thing quite simplistically and think either you can be with women or you can or you know, that kind of thing. He explained it very well. He said there was two sides to his personality with women. There was one whereby, you know, if he was really into a woman and he wanted to, to, to be with her, he could be really attentive. He could do everything that she wanted and, you know, be a normal sort of guy. But he said there was also the other side of him that, you know, when the woman wasn't there and, you know, his dick was hard one night, he'd go out looking for something. And, you know, that's basically wh where it was at. And I, I kind of appreciated that honesty. Uh, and I said to him, which was actually me walking into a trap, I said, which one is you? And he said, well, both. That's the point. You know, everybody has this dark and shade side to their personality. Uh, he, he didn't seem to think that any man could particularly be perfect when it came to women. And one of his opening gambits to me was, I'm a womanizer. I will always be a womanizer. I've cheated on every woman I've been with. He was very, very open about that. And that was, that's quite unusual. I've never heard anyone who does that kind of thing be quite so honest about it. It's, it's interesting because I feel like there's that level of honesty, but also like in the stories in John's life, I feel like there's a, a, a lot of dishonesty, right? It almost seems like he was a, a pathological liar in, in a lot of ways, Mark. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what I did know going into this was that, you know, well, first of all, what I should say is that I'm glad it turned out in the, in the format that it did because it was originally going to be John's autobiography written by me. And I knew, and I actually said it in the book, that if that had gone that way, he would have just been completely without any checks and balances. He could have just spun stories left and right. And you could have printed fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, what it did, the, the fact that I was involved, that gave at least some degree of pushback on some of these things. Uh, well, as a reader, I, I really appreciated that because the way you laid it out is you let him say what he needed to say, but like at the same time you had your commentary, which seemed to, which for me, I feel like there was more benefit in the commentary, frankly, because it kind of framed the, the conversation. Yeah, no, it, it had to be like that. And I have to say, this wasn't something that the publisher agreed with when, when I pitched this to them. They were like, I, I don't see how this can work. And I said, well, this is the only way this works because it has to have this, this backup voice challenging them on this stuff or else we could be printing anything and I'm not prepared to. So I think part of, this, part of the story was John's stories, which yes, they may have an element of exaggeration. There may be some mistruths. There's a lot of truth in there as well. But I think part of the story is trying to get him into a position and trying to get readers into a position whereby they can look at it and say, well, have we got to the sort of truth of this particular story? And I, I, I felt I was an important part of having to do that. And it's not a part I particularly wanted, but it was necessary. Well, one of, one of the things in, in his story... Um you know, it seems like, you know, early in his life he had, and, and I guess again, later in his life, he had a 
pretty severe drug problem. And and yeah. one of the things I found interesting, um, the, the, the line, the, I'm trying to remember the exact way he said the line to you, but it was that, um, you know, dealing drugs kept him in touch with the underbelly of society. And, and I'm, for him, I'm curious, like, why he felt he needed to be in touch with that underbelly. Did he think he was going to need it at some point in the future? Or, or what do you think was the point of him doing that? It's a really good point. I think, I think John always had a bit of a chip in his shoulder uh, in a lot of ways. He wasn't, he was, I mean, somebody said this to me, I think it was in, I think it was Eric, Eric, your friend's podcast, he actually threw this concept out that John was actually white trash. And I mean I, that. I can the see that though. I can definitely see that. Yeah, the politest possible way. He didn't come from a wealthy family. He wasn't some trust fund kid who'd been given everything. He was somebody who'd kind of dragged himself up. You know, his father committed suicide when he was young. He wasn't, they weren't wealthy. Grew up in Virginia, all that stuff. And I think John always felt a kind of a, a rooting in that kind of place. And when he got to the sort of very sort of stratospheric level of post McAfee, when, or even during McAfee, when he had so much money, he didn't know what to do with it. He did say that he was very uncomfortable with that corporate life. I mean, the idea of standing in a, a charity fundraiser or a boardroom or something like that was just not his world. It didn't he seem like he was. Kind of it didn't seem like he was made for it. Like it just seemed like he was a not square peg in a round hole. Yeah, totally. And he never wanted it. I mean, the whole the whole the the, the whole thing about it is that the McAfee company became McAfee Antivirus. That was an accident. That was just him sitting in the living room figuring out how to to put solutions to problems up on a on a message board. All of a sudden, he realized it can make a load of money. It was the right place at the right time. It became a big deal. But that's not what he wanted. And he never wanted uh, the sort of Bill Gates or the Richard Branson lifestyle. He he told me I was much more comfortable in a Mexican jail. And he told me ways how, you know, this is how you get into a Mexican jail. Just pick a bar fight somewhere and you'll be in one. Uh, that was the way, that was the world he, he, he liked for, for one reason or another. But I do think it was partly due to his upbringing. In, in his discussion with you, he talked about kind of those early days of, of Silicon Valley. And yeah. I didn't realize that there was this, and I don't know if he was embellishing again, but I didn't realize there was so much drug use, um, you know, in that area. It seemed like they just kind of did drugs, did some coding and did it for, for way too long. And then also um, the, the sex culture, I was a little bit, I guess, taken aback when he described, you know, one of the, the clubs he went to, which was kind of like a, li a little wild to me. But That's a good one. For, for you, what do you feel like, you know... In, influence he had on those early days of Silicon Valley, you know, being, you know, John McAfee as you knew him. Yeah, I mean, the, the drugs part I've corroborated elsewhere, that was a big culture mm -hmm. and it was a culture for a reason. These guys were presented with problems that needed solved fast. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were dealing with programming issues that, that you know, there's a, there's a threat to, to people's computers, we got to fix it. There isn't enough hours in the day, but you can make enough hours in the day if you're on speed. So the drug culture was hand in hand with the programming world because basically these guys needed to stay up all night. And the only way you can stay up all night is on some sort of amphetamine or whatever it is. So that part of it is true. Uh, that that was widespread. And I think once speed, et cetera, became fairly common in Silicon Valley, certain at the beginning for that reason. And then obviously things calmed down when companies got on top of threats, et cetera, et cetera. The sex side of it, I think, was John. I think John gravitated towards weird sex. I think he would have found people who were into that kind of thing wherever he went. There just happened to be a couple of guys in the company he worked with who were into it. And if they're going to say to him, hey, you fancy going to the catacombs in San Francisco and seeing some guy with spikes around his genitals, John was going to say yeah, I'm up that for it. description. I, I remember. I was at the time. I was actually at the car wash, and I was I was uh, washing my my wife's car, and I'm, I was a little bit. I had to stop because I was like, "Oh my god, people do this!" Like I was like so shocked. <laughs> there was one story. There was one story in there. You told me, but there was an old guy who just went there naked and lay like a. Sort oh, of and the lady step. like stepped on him. Yeah, every woman that went on the stage that night stepped over him. And this guy took pleasure in it. I mean, hey, listen, you know. Whoever turns you on, but John was definitely into that world, and you know he was always going to find people who also were. Do you think that was why he was so much into like you know encryption and secrecy and like privacy? Do you think it was because of that, or do you think just think his programming skills naturally took him in that area? I think they took him in that area. It's one thing he told me he never he never ever watched porn. Uh, that was one thing he did tell me, mm. uh, and that wasn't in the book, but he had said it elsewhere. And 
the reason he said that was because you know porn sites are the the least secure place you can go and he started going into getting deep into the weeds about keystroke technology and all that i get that i get that kind of stuff john wasn't into that i, I don't i don't really think there is a connection to crypto i think the crypto thing was more connected to the tax mm. aspect of him and that's something else we'll talk about uh, i think the tax is a big big thing in the mcafee world and i think crypto was the logical vehicle to it it helps that he knew about programming but i don't think there were connected well so i guess like understanding the silicon valley culture um it seems like for him you know he got he, it was hard to do it but he, he had reached sobriety at one point it seemed like this was actually a pretty big turning point in his life hmm. i guess what effect do you think mcafee reaching sobriety and even the process of doing so because it was it sounded like it was a really rough process what do you think that did for him I think it totally changed his life. Uh, I think John would have died had he not got sober, and he said so. Uh, I think he was on a very destructive path, and there was a great analogy he gave me, uh, which stays with me now, where he described this kind of point he reached, where it felt like he was standing on a street corner naked at night with a giant with a giant hole in his stomach with the wind blowing through it. Oh my and it gosh. Just, just felt so lonely and empty. I just thought, wow, imagine getting to that place. Well, he talks about he even flushing there. drugs down the toilet and figuring out how to go buy them somewhere else during the day. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's reasonably common sort of drug addict type behavior. You know, you, you, you flush it and you, you, know, you dig it out of the toilet or whatever you do. I, I know people do that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think he recognized that he was at a, he was at a cliff edge and he had to pull back from it. And I think it probably, yeah, I think it saved his life. Uh, John, and I, John and I talked a lot about addiction and how, how it works. And he, he, he kind of threw me what, I, what I, I now know is a fairly common addict's line. But in his case, it's actually pretty accurate because I hear a lot of addicts, and I've known a few, who say, you know, I can control this. I decide when I stop and when I start and all that kind of thing. And usually when I hear that, that means you can't decide when it stops. It decides. But in John's case, he actually did decide because from 1985, as you rightly said in the, the interview earlier, until 2011, 12, he didn't touch any drugs. Not, n none whatsoever. What do you think pulled uh, him back? A long time. What's that? What do you think pulled him back? Because um, I, I, you kind of allude to it in the book, but I guess personally, what do you think pulled him back to that? Back to drugs? Yeah. Yeah, duress. Just stress. the stress? I mean, I think you put John under real duress, and he was in Belize when he went back to drugs. Uh, just for anyone who doesn't know the story, you know, John ended up in a sort of heavily armed sort of compound in Belize. He was the enemy of the, the local militia and the government, etc., and he basically had to defend himself. I think at that point he was under enough strength, uh, enough stress that it pushed him back towards drugs again. He more or less said that mm -hmm. to me. You know, he said, when I'm under real stress, that's when I'll reach for drugs and I know the drugs to reach for. Uh, and he did. But until then, uh, you know, he went, uh, went about his business for, I can't work out in my head, but 30 plus years with no drugs in his life at all. That takes quite a lot of doing if you have that kind of personality. Yeah. Well, I, I, we'll concentrate more on Belize in a few minutes because that was kind of like the last yeah. third of his life. Like it seemed like it really had a sure. huge impact on that. But one of the one of the things I found really interesting is, you know, after he got sober, he had learned the Silicon Valley culture so well. Um, mm. you, you talked about um, that he would only take meetings on Fridays after seven, and um, when he would do that, it, it was genius when you think about it. He would. If people try to talk about business right away at the dinner, he would push them until later and say, no, no, because he knew at that point they hadn't either done enough drugs or had enough alcohol yet to be able to, like, put himself in control. And I guess, like, under, under him having that experience, I guess, how do you think that benefited him, you know, being clean and, and having the experience that others were still having? Yeah, I just think it, I mean, first of all, that's pure McAfee. I mean, John was a very, very... <laughs> he was calculating. Well, he was a very, very, a very, very smart observer of human nature. Uh, now, I know for a fact that he told me that he'd got himself into some awkward business situations himself while drinking and on drugs. And a smart person is going to say, wait a minute, this, this is what happened to me in that situation. Therefore, this could happen to somebody else. Now, if I remove myself from this and become the clear eyed guy in the room while everyone else is going down the path of, of you know, being a bit tipsy or having some drugs, the advantage that gives me is so huge. And John was looking for advantages. He was looking to sell his products to, to, 
to companies. And he told me that he did some very significant deals with guys who had been drinking, who under normal circumstances may well not have signed deals, but who did because of the circumstances. So it worked. I think he also told me that one of the guys was fired, or at least maybe a couple of them were fired because of this, because they took this back to their boss on the Monday or whatever, and the boss said, you know, what did we sign here? But I mean, that, that was just opportunism. And I think John understood the clarity that, I mean, he had a great mind. Mm -hmm. If you've got clarity and a great mind, you're in, you're in a very good place. And I think he saw that. If you appreciate the work that we do here and you want to support this show, the biggest way you can do that is by supporting the products that we know, use, and love, and that I recommend for you here on the show. The first that I want to talk about is my pillow, literally one of my favorite products. The my pillow classic is what I use every single night. It's handled a lot of my neck pain, a lot of my back pain. As you guys know, I've been a competitive powerlifter since my early twenties. I've retired from that, but I still take pretty good care of myself, and I'm still pulling some heavy weights as I pulled 500 last week on deadlift. And uh, our favorite product from we travel is actually the my pillow travel pillow, and it's one of the things that we actually give to absolutely everybody. It is a great product to fall asleep on. So if you want to go to mypillow.com slash C-Y-O-L, they have some really great holiday deals over there. You can get up to 66% off of select products. Also, one of the biggest changes in my life over the years has been handling a lot of the parasites in my body. A number of years ago, I did a cleanse with uh, Dr. Jason Dean, and we removed these things called liver fluke from my body. They were actually eating my liver. It was kind of crazy. And Every few months, I do either a parasite cleanse or his full moon detox that he's doing right now. So if you want to head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L and uh, grab some of his amazing products over there. I know he has a great holiday special going on right now as well. Support our sponsors. They help this show to continue and they help us to do what we're doing. And we could not do it without you. And you could do it just by uh, using the power of the purse and uh, supporting the products that we love. Thanks. Why do you think he ended up leaving the McAfee company? Because it seemed like they, you know, he did well. He had made some money, and and I guess that was another thing I was curious about. Is like how much money did he actually make? Because it seemed like the guy was always building a house, either living there or not living there, and and somehow still had money to do it. So I guess you know why did he leave, and and how much do you actually think he made? Yeah, I think he left. I mean, the the leaving part really simple. And it goes back to what I told you before. He just wanted. He could see that it had gone from being sort of guerrilla warfare mm -hmm. on the front line against viruses with him in an office and a bunch of other guys. It had gone from being that to being boardrooms, charity, fundraisers, that kind of stuff. And he just didn't want that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he lost the enthusiasm for the fight at that point and decided, well, okay, I've made a lot of money. Let's go and do something else. As far as how much he made, he gave me a couple of figures 100 million was one of them, 150 was the other, I think. It just doesn't seem like no. enough money, though. It seems, it seems like he would have run out a lot sooner. Yeah, well, I pinned him on that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, do, I, do, I do recognize you put 100 million in the bank, you know, it's going to make interest pretty fast. Yeah. And he, his argument, you know, he was building houses for 8, 10 million here, 20 million there. And I said, but hold on a minute, if you build four of those, you've got none left. And he said, yeah, but you have to remember that while I'm building one for eight, there's still 92 million sitting in the bank earning interest. And his strategy on that was interesting, too, because he said he wasn't a very aggressive um, investor. He said he wouldn't care to make 1% if he always made 1% and didn't lose anything. Yeah, no, that's true. But that's one area I'm not 100% convinced about because there are stories online that say that John lost a load of money in the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, he quite well documented. He claimed that I, wasn't I, I true, though. That. Didn't he claim that he wasn't true? He denied it yeah. to me. He denied it. He said, no, I had all my uh, investments in secure funds and you know safe investments, etc. Didn't lose anything. Now, what is possible is that he was building these houses, and you know, for anyone who doesn't know, he was building places in Hawaii, places in Ecuador, Texas, all over the place, crazy places. Yeah. yeah, everything. It could be that they devalued in the financial crisis to the extent mm -hmm. that he ended up losing a lot of money. That's possible. That, you know, you never quite know what the what, what the real story is. But I don't think he lost a ton of money in the financial crisis. Uh, and I think he somehow made it all work to the extent that he could build these places, which to me was some of the maddest stuff because, I mean, there, there was one place in Texas that he built 
I think it cost him $10 million and I, I don't think he spent a night in it or if he did spend a night in it, it was maybe one or two, mm-hmm. which was unfathomable to me. And I said, I said so. I said, this is absurd. And he said, well, it's really not about the house. It's about... It's, you know, consider it like sculpture or art or something like that. You know, I assemble this place. I buy all the, the furnishings from all over the world. <laughs> you know, I buy the carpets from Japan. I buy the stone from Bolivia. I mean, he, he loved that, all, that whole sort of journey. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't about living there. It was just about, can I do this? And the answer was, yes, I can. And, you know, hey, listen, if you've got the money and you can do it, that's, that's your prerogative. It just, to me, it was unfathomable. It seems like if you look at McAfee's life, like, and, and, you know, maybe it'd be more than this, but it seems like there's only like, there's almost like three lives within it. There, like there's the early one yeah. where he has these stages of taking these different jobs, making way too much money, breaking off marriages. Then he moves into the, the Silicon Valley, John. And then the last third of his life, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Like he was a, a, a yoga cult leader for a little bit. He supposedly was running away from the Belizean government. He was married to a hooker. Um, how would you put together that last third of John's life? Like, what do you, like, had he just lost touch with reality there? What do you think happened? <laughs> I think there was a turning point. Uh, I think the yoga stuff in Colorado was actually quite normal for him. That was, that was cool. I mean, he did tell me what it was for. It was to get women. Yeah. Um, and he said it was kind of like know, a, he ended up like a cult leader and people like were, were ready to run him out of town again. <laughs> exactly. It, inevitably, it gets to that point where people get pissed off with you. And at the same time, simultaneously, I should say he was doing, he was doing this aero trekking venture, which let's be honest, isn't everyone's idea of fun. If, you, if you're a neighbor or whatever, you got this guy flying around in these air, aircraft, it's going to piss some people off. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure there was a bit of that. And I also think, and this is something that's consistent with later in Belize as well, I think if you're a, a sort of rich white guy who's quite ostentatious and you rock up in some town in Colorado or you rock up in Molokai, Hawaii, locals are going to get unhappy. They're going to be like, who is this guy and why is he here and, you know, what does he want type of thing. That's just human nature. So I think the turning point was when his nephew was killed in one of these air trekking accidents. Uh, I think that really damaged John, albeit that it, it wasn't, the thing that upset him most in our conversations, I was surprised by that. There was something else that upset him more than that. But he was definitely upset by it. But I think at that point, he was just done. He said, I'm just leaving. You know, I'm leaving the US. Uh, I'm going to do something else. And I think the, the, the move to Belize in sort of around 2008, was a, it, was an, it was a move intended to be older guy. I'm going to go and live out the rest of my life quietly lying on the beach. I think that was the plan. But plans don't work out like that when you're John McAfee. So do you feel like he was telling the truth about Belize? Because it almost seemed like they got way too pissed off at him for something that seems like it was a pretty minor infraction, though there was, you know, him at some point maybe maybe did or didn't kill his neighbor. Um, so I guess, like, like, what do you make of the, the Belize situation? And do you think they were actually chasing him as long as he thinks they were? The Belize situation was a potential deal breaker for me in terms of this book. I was, as I I said it in there, I was willing to walk away from the book if I had not believed what John said about his neighbor. Mm. Now, just to give people a bit of context, what happened in Belize was that John went into, initially lived in a tourist area, moved into a inner inland area populated only by natives, started meddling in the drug business, trying to flush out drug dealers, trying to meddle in uh, pimp business. Now it turns out that in places like Belize, you need to understand how things work there. They don't work like they work in the Western world. The government had a big hand in the drugs trade in Belize. It was one of the Wait, government that's not how it works here? That's how I thought it worked here. Anyway, <laughs> we, we won't dive into that, but anyway. <laughs> it's, a bit more, it's a bit more explicit down there. Yeah. Uh, although I take your point. But, you know, all of a sudden, again, here you are. We've been just coasting along fine forever. We've been doing our drug thing. We've got a bunch of pimps. We're kind of on top of it. All of a sudden, this white guy comes, turns up, and 
you know, all the local women are going to him and he's got this big enclave and he's driving around in jeeps with guns and it's like, who is this guy? What, what, what are we going to do with him? Well, not and, just that. And even the confusion as well where he had a, he had a PhD, an honorary PhD, I think it was, not even a real, was it, it was an honorary. And so he was, was Dr. PhD. McAfee. So the women started coming to him thinking he could fix their babies, but he wasn't actually that Absolutely. kind of doctor. <laughs> Absolutely. You're exactly right. It was a, an honorary PhD from the college in Roanoke where he, where he studied and of course he loved that because the idea of being dr mcafee just loved he, he he that titillated him but the point is that it got to the point where he was just a pain in the ass he was shutting down the drug trade and uh they wanted rid of him and i don't believe that he was manufacturing drugs in belize that's one story that was kind of teased pretty heavily in the the showtime documentary it was it was made out like he was making meth or whatever in the jungle that wasn't the case don't believe that uh, I do think he was under a lot of pressure from the Belizean government. I think they wanted rid of him. I think they wanted to frame him. Uh, one thing that isn't really sort of discussed in too much detail in the book is that John, when he wanted information as to what the government had planned for him, actually donated laptops to the government in Belize, which they accepted very gratefully, but didn't realize that they had keystroke technology built into them. So he got... He got a lot of uh, insider info on that Belizean government, and they knew it. Wow. And they, want, they wanted something on him to get rid of him. I think they framed him for the, the Gregory Fall uh, death. And I, I eyeballed John on this very, very seriously, and, and, I, uh, and I said it in the book. I was willing to walk away if I didn't believe him. I would have said, listen, cool. It's been cool talking to you. It would have been fun, but I don't, I don't buy this story, and we can't do it. I didn't feel like that. I thought he was framed. That's my opinion. And then, you know, they, do you think that they really were chasing him for as long as they were chasing him? Because he comes back to the U.S. Um, you know, he's, he's married to this woman, um, Janice. Janice. Um, she tries yeah. to kill him a few times. Her pimp is living in his attic. Like, like I, I can't even begin on this, Mark. Like, it's, it's, it's wild. And then every turn, he seems to think the Belizean government's still after him. Do you think he's just paranoid from all that time he lived through it? Or do you think it was true at that point? No, I think, I think they did have feelers out. I mean, there's only so much you can do from Belize. Yeah. Uh, but what you can do is you can contract somebody in the U.S. to try and do your dirty business for you. And I have no doubt whatsoever that did happen. Uh, I think Janice's pimp was contacted by Belizean officials and told to try and apprehend him. And I think there was a couple of others. There was a quite a notable American businessman who I didn't name in the book. Uh, for privacy reasons, it was nothing to be gained by doing it, who John told me was contracted by people in Belize. I mean, we're talking pretty heavy people down there in Belize when you start moving away from government officials into sort of drug cartel bosses. I don't doubt there was some heavy people involved. Uh, when he even mentions the, the hitman at one point, and he, he even says, well, you know, I guess, dare I say his name here? Um, and I guess since he's passed, you, you mentioned it in the book. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this guy, this guy that down in Belize, Rodwell, Rodwell, uh, his first name is, he just seemed to be this sort of, yeah, he was just a thug and he would pretty much do anything that anyone paid him to do. And, you know, he operated without limitation in Belize by what I understand. Uh, and then the next thing I hear from John is that Rodwell's in San Francisco or something like that. And that's a whole different ballgame yeah. when this guy's in, in, in the U.S., I think there was a grudging respect between those two. Uh, I think it got to that point. But I have to say, I do agree with you. Some of the, some of the stories uh, John told me about Tennessee, there was a story in Portland about hiding in a dumpster, you know, the firing shotgun blast through the wall of his house. And <laughs> they had to move the because the attic was so beaten up from all the shotgun blasts. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sleeping with one eye open, literally, and the other finger on a shot. I mean, it's, it is literally the stuff of movies. Mm -hmm. But it, it probably did happen in some form. Uh, now, whether it was legitimate threats, whether it was John with a bit of paranoia, we'll never know. Mm -hmm. I think there was something to it. I, th I do think there was something to it. And, and you know, f towards the end of his life, he, he kind of does, you know, have this spiral. He ends up eventually in a, in a Spanish prison. Um, yeah. And, you know, it seemed like you were very conflicted in the end of what actually happened to John. Um, and mm. and I'm, I guess I'm curious, like, you know, what do you think happened to John McAfee in the end? Yeah, let, let me just say why he ended up there. And this is quite an important part of the McAfee story. Yeah. And this goes back to tax. John left the U.S. because of a, a grand jury indictment 
uh, for tax evasion, mm -hmm. or rather not filing tax returns. Now, listen, plenty of people don't pay tax. I don't, that's not something I'm advocating. Uh, and plenty of people get away with it. And John would have got away with it. In fact, he did get away with it for eight years. But what, what he did, and this was intentional, was he went out there and basically poked the hornet's nest. He was going out there on, on crypto cruises, on his yacht, on seminars in Barcelona and Stockholm, basically saying cryptocurrency is the future. I didn't pay tax. And if you don't want to pay tax, this is what you do. Now, all of a sudden, you're a major problem if you're someone like John McAfee with a million followers on Twitter, somebody who's dabbling in presidential campaigns, you're too big a profile for the government to tolerate that kind of sort of uh, advice that they're putting out there. So I think he became a problem. And I think that was John's undoing. And I think his desire to stick it up the SEC or the IRS or whoever, that was his downfall. Uh, now, as far as his death is concerned, You know, I've been conflicted on this, and I, I probably still I am. I just don't I, feel I, like he killed himself. I just don't see it. Mm, I, I, I didn't think like that for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do know John... I mean, okay, here's one side of it. On one side of it, John had a life force that was unbreakable. He spent his entire life trying to stay alive, did it very well. He wanted to live, all right? So on that side, you got that. Why would a guy kill himself in prison? Uh, on the other side, you've got this situation whereby 75 years old, you're going to be extradited. Now, I should be clear and say that that extradition, albeit that it was approved, could have taken a year, could have taken a couple of years before it actually happened. And people tie together the two things, the, the announcement that the extradition was passed and his death. They're not really connected because John knew this would happen. They knew this was coming. They'd prepared for it. They had legal stuff in the background. These two are unconnected. Uh, and I don't think it was suddenly a case of, oh, we've got this news, life is over, I'm going to kill myself. Don't think it was like that. What I think is more likely is that John had got there, been in jail for eight, eight months, just ran out of gas and just thought, okay, I can fight this, don't have much money left. I'll fight it and I'll probably end up back in the US. And John did say to me, if I ever end up back in the US in a prison, I will just disappear. And I think he's right. He would have ended up in some faceless place in, I don't know, middle of nowhere, John McAfee, you know, the great renegade, reduced to sort of uh, nothing whatsoever, part of the system. I just don't think John wanted that. Yeah. And I could see a point where he could reach where he think, Hey, listen, I've probably done enough. I've had enough. Uh, and I could see a suicide. Could I also see someone, you know, all manner of different other bad guys? I mean, I should also say, I don't know every aspect of John's life. It seemed like he there had enough other enemies where that could have happened. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are other dimensions to his life that I don't know. Uh, and these are just subjects we never happened to talk about. I mean, he was in the dark web. He was, you know, in this crypto world. He had... Crypto people from Belarus and Russia, I believe he was in partnership with. I just don't know the extent of that sort of dark world. Uh, is it possible that somebody could have been paid enough to do something? Could it be government related? I have just no idea. Uh, on the balance of all of the evidence I have, my, I would probably lean towards suicide at the moment. That's just where I am. It might change. And I guess what do you make of this whole, like, um, I guess you'd call it a conspiracy theory he got wrapped into that he had this hard drive and he had all this stuff on it and there was a dead man switch. And I, I saw that come out and I'm like, they pulled John McAfee into this thing? Like, I don't, I don't quite get it. Like, I guess, what do you make of all that? Like, is it bunk? What is it? I never bought it. Uh, I, I didn't either from the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I never bought into it. And I mean, John told me, you know, I've got some information on such and such. And, you know, I, you know, he told me about the CIA agent who tried to bust him in, in the Bahamas and John doxed him. And I know the guy's name. I didn't put it in the book. There was nothing to be gained by doing that because it was already made public by John. That might have been the extent of the kind of thing John had. I think people jumped to this conclusion for some reason that John had information on the Clintons and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I don't know if you ever saw the stuff about the condo in Miami. I didn't hear about that one. Yeah, there was a story that, you know, the condo that blew up in Miami, this was the place where John's hard drive was and all this. And listen, you know how that stuff goes. Yeah. 
And I think once some momentum gets behind that kind of thing, it, there is no there's no limit to where it can go in terms of conspiracy theory. And I think what didn't help was the the Q symbol on his Instagram. I don't know if you knew that story. Yeah, few, no, I did. He, I did hear about that. It was like one of the last things before he died on his Instagram. But, yeah, but who's to say he even did it? Somebody could have hacked his account. Well, no, he definitely didn't do it because John told me he'd never once logged into his Instagram. Oh, well, there you now, go. I do know. I do know that John had a lot of people who surrounded him in different ways and different at different distances. Mm-hmm. He had a, a lot of hangers on. Well, there was even the, the know, guy both. that wrote the blog that John basically funded, right? So, like, he, he's got a lot of things he yeah. was in he maybe have forgotten about. Yeah, there's a load of stuff like that. And it is entirely possible that some, someone could have had access to an Instagram. Uh, big deal. People jumped on that. Also, there was the Telegram account, which I don't know if you knew about. It, it started just cranking stuff. Yeah from almost the day that John died and continued cranking stuff for some months. The only problem with that stuff was that I didn't see much of it, but a lot of it was shown to me. A lot of it was old. Yeah. There was there was not a great deal of new stuff in there. It's stuff that if people were willing to dig into it, they'd establish that it was you know in the public domain already or it'd been said before. It just didn't add up. But but the point is none of this helps. Because what it does is it perpetuates the the minds of people who just want a conspiracy theory, you know. And all I got for six months on Twitter was, "When's the dead?" You know, I'd say something about the book, and people would say, "Yeah, great, but when's the dead man switch getting pressed?" And you know, I just don't think there is one. Well, I never did think there was one. I, I'm I'm somebody, Mark, that like I you know I want to understand things. I, I research things. I don't always believe what I'm told, but like at the certain time, I do believe there's like a, a world of what's plausible and what's not. I have some yeah. friends and you probably know people like this that like, if their trash disappears, it's a conspiracy. They, they always want a good one. And there, there just are people out there like that, that are going to look for it, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, I listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not denigrating these people that, you know, whatever you want to believe, but you know, when it gets to a point that the evidence to the contrary of something is sort of irrevocable and indisputable, I think that's the point to drop it. Yeah. And I think with John, I mean, there was several countdowns in the sort of immediate weeks and months after his death. It was like, this is the day that this stuff will drop and it counted down to zero, nothing happened. And as usual, people said, yeah, well, you know, if you divide that date by 16 and then you remove 16 from John F. Kennedy's birthday, we'll arrive at a new date and that will be the new date that the new stuff drops. And of course, nothing happens. I just think it was nothing. Uh, and I don't think there ever will be anything. I think there's no dead man switch. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm about the same thought process. And, and I guess like looking at it, Mark, you know, like, you know, you most likely, you know, know John McAfee a lot better than a lot of people because of how much he's told you about his life. But I guess, you know, going through this whole process and I guess reflecting on it, do you feel like you really know John McAfee at this point? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, and and, and it's that, that question has been kind of brought into even sharper relief as a result of these conversations, because quite a lot of people have asked me about certain things in John's life that I just don't know about. Uh, and I've explained this a little bit. You know, there's certain dimensions of John, Crypto's one, Dead Man's Switch and all that stuff, pooping through hammocks, sniffing bath salts, all that stuff. We never talked about, not once, never even entered the, the equation with him. Uh, now, that's not to say that it didn't happen, but I think John had the sort of myth meme world that he existed in. And I also think he had the real man world that he existed in. I think he gave me the real John McAfee in terms of his feelings, his philosophies, his thoughts on religion. He was, I mean, let's be honest, he was pretty open with me, pretty exposed, pretty vulnerable and on a lot of things. I don't think, I, I mean, he loved a bit of hype, don't get me wrong, and I, and I loved hearing it. Mm-hmm. But I do think he opened up a lot. Uh, I've got a thinly sketched view of John McAfee. I wouldn't like to say that it's a, a full color portrait. Yeah. I'd say thinly sketched with some shade and some some contrast. But that might, I mean, as somebody said in a review that I was very grateful for, that might be all we ever get. Yeah. And it might just be that this, you know, the same review said, this is the only book that could have ever been written about John McAfee. And if that's the case, you know, I'm very pleased to take that accolade. But, you know, will I ever or anyone else ever get the full picture? I doubt it. It's it's interesting because I feel like you did such an excellent job putting this whole thing together, gathering information, you know, trying to put all the threads together. But I think in some ways I'm, I'm more confused about John McAfee his life after reading the whole book because I'm like 
He almost feels like a like a unicorn, like a like a mythical creature. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think that's what he wanted, and, and, and I'll be honest and say that that's partly what I wanted to leave people with. Okay. Uh, this feeling of being slightly confused by it all. He, he's like the, the he's like the guy, guy from the Dosakis commercials if he was real. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're left at the end of it thinking, what what was that, and who was that, and but that's. <laughs> That is what McAfee is all about. And I think that's the point, kind of. You know, I think people want things to be cut and dried and at the end of it say, right, I've got this, I've got this absolutely nailed down. This was this guy. You're just not gonna get that with McAfee. He's like trying to sort of capture mercury, <laughs> you know, in your hands. You can't do it. Well, uh, I'm glad that's what you, you were going try. for then. Cause I was, uh, so I was, I did your whole book in audio book and, um, I had, right. I had just finished chopping firewood and I'm carrying it in the house when it, when it got to the end of the book and I get done, I go, what the hell just happened? And my wife goes, what do you mean? What the hell just happened? I'm like, I just finished the book and I'm very confused. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of that yeah. in, a, in a way, because if I'd come up with something that was quite sort of dry and predictable, I think. I feel disappointed and I think people would be too. I, I feel like I, I need a sequel. I, I feel like I need a part two though. I, I need it. <laughs> you might be on to, you might be onto something. All right. You might be onto something. There might be something. I, listen, I have thought about it. I have thought about it and have been approached about it. Uh, there is an angle that I'm deliberating about. Uh, and Interesting. I'll tell you when I, when I do know, but you know, I wanted it to be this kind of curious thing. I wanted it to be this kind of unsettling unsatisfactory, confusing book. Uh, because I think there's enough sort of humdrum books out there about people that are just like, okay, we get we get it, we get what the life was. I, I, I'd like people to have more questions about John McAfee than they have answers. And I think the book does that. What do you think his legacy looks like? What is the, the and, and maybe there's a few legacies. There, there's, you know, John McAfee, the enigma. There's John McAfee, the, the you know, the, the software developer. He did change that world a lot. I guess, what do you think his legacy is? I don't. I think there's two. And I, I, it depends on what side of the fence you're on. Uh, one side of the fence is he's the champion of freedom. He's the renegade. He's the stick it to the man. That's one. Mm-hmm. The other one is nut job killer, drug addict. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. There's there's he literally he is that polarizing, and there's not much in between and, and the sad part of it is that the the, the programmer aspect the ge- the math genius aspect of it is the bit that will probably drop between the cracks in the in the legacy mm. uh the people who know will know but i think to the general public i mean let's be honest there aren't many articles out there or haven't been since his death about john's prowess in programming that's not what they've been you know i've been involved in two articles one with the daily mail the other with the new york post one was about women the other one's about drugs you know, that's what you're going to get with John. And I think, you know, for the the man in the street, it's those two things. Nut job, absolute nut job, or he's our champion. And there there isn't a lot in between those two. Well, as you reflect on, you know, this project, and, and I, I, I do think... Um you know, you mentioned that you decided you were going to run it just as as is and not as an autobiography, which honestly I think did it the best justice. I think it was the right way to do yeah. it. But I guess like as Didn't you have a choice, yeah. As you reflect on this project, um, you know, I guess what do you feel like you learned, or what do you feel like you know if there was anything that changed in you after you went through this experience? Hugely. I mean, for me, it was life changing, uh, and I don't say that lightly because you know I've I've had some good projects. I've worked with great people. There is something about this kind of project, and that's part of the reason why I chose it. You go into this kind of world and it will change you. You're you're dealing with somebody who is as complex as John. The process itself was so mind-bending, you know, trying to get this guy on Skype calls, him turning up with no clothes on, you know. It it literally was madness. And I had to question my sanity at several points during that. But at, at the end of it, and the other thing that I haven't really touched upon at all is the kind of philosophy that, that I found appealing about John. You know, if you're a guy of a certain age, there is no doubt that somebody 20 years older than you who is a little bit further down the line in terms of knowledge and experience can give you a lot. I got a lot of that from John. Uh, and I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that he was like a father figure, but he definitely gave me some kind of insight into the the, the, the vagar as a human nature that my own father couldn't have, simply because of the kind of life that John lived. John lived this sort of multi-dimensional life. 
uh, and he imparted a lot of wisdom. You had to dig deep for the wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to dig through all the hype and all the nonsense, but there was a lot of wisdom in there. And I think going forward, I probably understand a lot more about human beings uh, as a result of working with John. And that's something I'm really grateful for. Well, Mark, I, I really enjoyed this conversation today, and I and I, I, I appreciate um, you know your insight. I appreciate the thoughtfulness. And for people listening, you know, if they want to connect with you, um, I know I follow you on Twitter. You know, where should they follow you? Where can they find out more about your work? And you know, where can they grab this book? Because I you know, I know we went through a lot of it today, but I definitely recommend they read it for themselves. Yeah, I think it's something you need to read if you're interested in not just McAfee, but in people in general. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. You can find it at Barnes & Noble. It's sort of all the usual places. There's an audio book that's uh, not written by, not read by me or him, actually, read by somebody who's done a very good job. Uh, there's an e-book. There's a hardcover. There is one thing I do want to say. Yeah. Uh, coming up pretty soon, we're doing a special edition uh, planned with a sort of NFT angle. And I have to say, this is not something I fully understand. I'm not that kind of well-versed in that whole world, but I do know that it's important. And anyone who's interested in a very, very special edition of this book should keep a lookout on my Twitter, which is at Mark Eglinton. Uh, I'll be announcing what's happening. I'll be telling people how this works, how they can be part of it. Uh, and, it's, and it's a major signal in terms of where publishing is going. And I think it's really appropriate that it should be a John McAfee book that is one of the means of delivering that signal. So really just keep an eye out on Twitter. Uh, I'm reasonably active on there. I'll be doing stuff on there to, related to the book and other things. So that's, that's really it. Very cool. Well, Mark Eglinton, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, my friend. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you it. once again for watching this video. Reminder, like this video, leave us a comment, smash that subscribe button if you support liberty, freedom, and want to build a better future. We're here every Monday and Wednesday with brand new episodes, and we do release some special content pieces and, and segments throughout the week. So you definitely want to check those out. Share us with your friends and uh, help us to make a bigger impact out there because we cannot do it without you. And uh, you are the fuel that helps us to make a big impact out there. So I'll have a great one and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.